I had a group of students in the early mid 70s and they decided they needed summer jobs and um, there was no such thing as a blue box yet. What the students wanted to do was get trucks and go around and pick it up, something the cities weren't doing at the time. And they went to the city of Peterborough and asked if um, they would help them and they said, well, I don't think you can convince people to sort their garbage. And the students up and leafleted people's houses, and they did sort their garbage. They did very well. Whole truckloads were avoiding landfills. And very shortly, a year or two after that, I think it was in Kitchener, the first blue boxes came out, and then it really caught on. So, I mean, that changed how industries operated. Everything didn't have to come fresh from the forest or fresh, fresh from a mine. It, it, it could be recreated from things we've already used. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast. This podcast series tackles some of the big questions in the field of environmental politics for university students in Canada. I'm Peter Andre from Carleton University, and my co-host for the show is Ryan katz from the University of Ottawa. How's it going, Ryan? I'm good, thanks, Peter. Uh, and I'm happy to be joining this conversation with uh, the great Bob Pielke. Okay, well, let me introduce Bob then. In this episode, we'll be speaking with Robert Pelkey, Professor Emeritus at Trent University, where he taught environmental politics and policy for uh, 35 years. I'm not going to list all his books and accolades, as we'd need a whole show for that alone. But uh, suffice it to say, Bob is one of Canada's most respected and most seasoned voices in the field of environmental politics. It's not an exaggeration to say he played an important role in founding this field, both in Canada and internationally. And that's why we have him here as our guest on our show, examining the history of environmental politics in Canada. So any historical narrative has to start somewhere. And as we've discussed in other episodes in this series, each narrative has its own positionality. So to start off this discussion, we're going to go back to the late 60s and early 70s and hear about the origin of Bob's journey into ecopolitics. Let me welcome you to the show, Bob. Hi, Peter. How have you been? I've, I've uh, had a great summer, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I, you and I haven't spoken for a few years, so uh, really looking forward to talking with you and Ryan today. So, Bob, I'm going to jump in here. Um, as Peter said, uh, we'd like to start off by taking a bit of a trip down memory lane. Uh, so you have been following and actively a part of the environmental movement in Canada since you came to this country from the United States in the late 1960s. And I, I believe you started at Trent University in 1970, so that's 50 years ago. How would you characterize the environmental movement in Canada at that time? It goes way, way back to when I was a grad student at UBC um, in the, from 67 to 70. So this, I'm sort of going to characterize the time, late 60s, very early 70s. And that was an, the activism was very dynamic. A lot of people were interested all of a sudden, even though Previously, there's a long history of conservation, wilderness protection, creation of national parks dating back to the 19th century. But the newness was that the focus was much more on urban issues, air and water pollution, mm -hmm. smog, Great Lakes, and from 72 or so on, resource depletion and a series of oil price crises that made people wonder if they could afford to drive anymore. Um, so it was a, a very dynamic time. The media focused on it. Every major paper had a, an environmental journalist on the beat. Hmm. And um, I, guess, I mean, that captures the time and it was pretty hard not to think about it. Um, and hmm. as I was just starting out teaching, within two or three years, students were asking that there be courses on such things so we created them at Trent in the in the in the early 70s and there were all kinds of new institutions were created elsewhere York University and virtually all universities within about 10 years and the 
The Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S. was created in 1969, Environment Canada 1971. So there were new institutions um, created everywhere. Meanwhile, lots of other people had doubts about cities and industrial society and went back to the land. <laughs> Hippies in Toronto suddenly moved to Barry's Bay and grew vegetables. Anyway, that, I hope, captures the era. That definitely does capture it. And maybe if I could just ask a quick follow-up, uh, Bob, would you say there was a, a particular Canadian flavor to the environmental movement at that time that distinguished it from from this, the environmental movement in the United States? Or would you say it was more a sort of a, a variation on a similar theme? I think the resource depletion side of it really came home in Canada because we're, and even more then, we're a resource-producing country. Logging, pulp and paper, mining, we still are uh, to a great extent. Energy production, all of those things were, you know, were even, an even bigger focus here because that's what our industry was, even more so then than now. And so, Bob, how would you say the environmental movement has evolved or changed from the 60s to today? You know, has the composition or priorities of that movement changed in your view? I think the priorities have changed a lot. Um, that sort of back to the land spirit shifted because there was a greater acceptance of urban life because it was people figured out that it, an urban life was less energy intensive per person and less resource intensive per person. Homes are smaller in cities. You share walls and ceilings and floors, and the, so the heating amount is, is less. Um, I think that made a big difference. And you can walk and cycle and, and use transit, which isn't an option in Barry's Bay. You're not going to cycle <laughs> to Sudbury um, you know, mm. for, to get your groceries. Um, so I, th I think that, that shift was, was quite significant, and more so the, the, the sort of anti-industry reaction of, of early environmentalism, because industry polluted, shifted to more a desire to have new industries. That kind of began with Amory Lovins, who said, you know, we can't oppose all energy sources, we need to find new ones, uh, so-called mm -hmm. soft, energy, soft energy path. Uh, renewables, um, and we're we're still working on that at a you know much greater rate. Early environmentalism was mostly fo focused on local issues, the polluting factory in your town or in your neighborhood, and it moved towards a global perspective over time: acid rain, climate change, ozone depletion, that kind of global issue, things that could only be resolved globally. And the other dimension that was added in was environmental justice. That began in the 80s. Um, a fellow named Robert Bullard, whom I had the pleasure of meeting once or twice, from Texas, hmm. uh, basically did studies finding that in black and native communities that were much more likely to have hazardous waste treatment plants cited or hazardous waste dumps or pollution. The pollution levels were higher. He was a, an environmental sociologist and measured all these things. And it ultimately led, I think it was the early 90s, to legislation on environmental justice and something that's still going on quite thoroughly now. I'm glad you brought that up. We are uh, going to compliment uh our discussion with you with a whole episode that talks about environmental justice and environmental racism. And uh, so uh, the, the, the students will definitely be hearing more about that. Um, just to follow up on what you've just been talking about, I, I wonder if you can tell me a bit about how effective you think the, the, the environmental movement as a social movement has been in its calls for change. And maybe we can think about that on three different levels in terms of how people live their lives and and think about themselves in relation to the environment, how industries behave, and then what governments do or don't do. Yeah, how do personal lives, how have they been affected? Um, one is, I mean, there's 
been a wide acceptance of using less, recycling, etc. Um, that's a shift in how we live our everyday lives. But there's much, much more than that. Um, and it really gives a sign of how much things have changed. To be a vegetarian back in those days, day in you know 1970 was very very unusual to demand to get organic produce was seen as really weird it was just unusual it, you know some farmers markets would feature it but the big supermarkets barely knew what you were talking about um, and, and that's those are big changes so anyway that's the personal lives dimension of things and if I can just follow up in there, Bob, the uh, because you're, you're you're making it sound like everything has gone in the right direction, and <laughs> so just to be the dev- devil's advocate here, uh, you know, I, I think people are taking way more plane rides than they ever did then, and the net uh, environmental impact of a plane ride uh, probably, uh, you know, will will make up for a lot of cycling trips that that person might even make to work. Uh, so. I suspect, but you would know the, the the data on this, that our net per capita consumption of goods and energy has continued to go up despite, uh, you know, statements that people make that they want to see a green environment. I think that's probably true. Sort of energy use s- still is still going up, although it has slowed in, in recent years. But yes, mm. more people fly airplanes, far more than in the in the 70s um, but it's still a majority of people almost never get on a plane I mean globally for sure but even in Canada right um, a majority and it's not for environmental reasons well and, and I guess the other dimension here you mentioned the uh, say the or, the shift to more organics visible in supermarkets and you mentioned uh, you know the recycling all of that was only possible with industry also getting on board. So you can have individuals who might believe the world should be different, but then you also need industry and government. So maybe we should just turn to what impact do you think the movement's had on, on, on how industry operates in Canada? It's got two dimensions. One is I think you could characterize small businesses as including quite a large number now, especially in the last 10 to 20 years, of green entrepreneurs, people who grow local organic food, create sustainable products, solar panels, install solar panels, low carbon building materials, um, embedded carbon building materials as well. Um, Even vintage goods stores, our so-called former second-hand stores, have an environmental virtuous side. And they, and people who run those businesses pretty much always think of them in those terms. So I think that's um, a big change. And, and some large corporations, by no means all of them, have uh, grown up around it. I mean, Tesla is one of the biggest corporations in the world, and they make electric cars and solar roof tiles and various other basically green products um, and other car companies are following suit some I think it's Volkswagen intends to make nothing but electric vehicles in five or ten years um, BMW gives you a coupon if you buy an electric BMW for a mere ninety thousand dollars you get a coupon that gets you five or ten thousand dollars off on a on solar panels installed on your roof hmm. So some big corporations are trying, is what I'm saying, and I think some of them are created for for that reason. There's still, of course, a whole long list of mostly resource sector companies that haven't exactly caught on to this um, and resist every step of the way um, making big changes. You know, some of our listeners won't have been born until the 2000s. And so they they might look at industry and say, well, they're, they're still causing so much, uh, so many problems for the environment, say climate change and, and other problems. And uh, the story you're telling is, uh, shows just how far the movement has come and how much change has been made. Um, but for those industries that are, uh, that you're also talking about that are laggards, you know, it feels like, it seems that that's the space for the state. 
right? To yeah. um, to pick up on environmental values and uh, either regulate or incentivize some of those uh, brown industries to become greener. And I and I just wonder what, looking back, what effect do you feel this movement has had on the state uh, and what governments do and don't do? I think we had a, a great deal of influence. Even in the 70s, all kinds of new legislation and a whole series of air and water pollution regulations were put in place. And for the most part, industries went along with it. And I think it was probably because those rules were negotiated with those industries. What can you do and what can't you do? And it was kind of a compromise kind of thing. Um, governments didn't move easily to encouraging a post-carbon economy. I mean, it, it has recently, but it took a long time to get beyond just kind of negotiated middle-of-the-road uh, regulations and not take steps towards building a different kind of economy more aggressively. But I do see signs that um, saw them in 2008 where a lot of um, – Governments built their 2000 and recession recovery around green industries as the industries of the future. And I think that made a big difference in the creation of companies like Tesla and other those that produce solar and wind. I mean, wind energy is now, you know, produces more energy than coal in most countries, um, including Canada. Um, so those are pretty big changes, and those are the kinds of changes that I could see coming for the for the post-COVID recovery, when, the, when there's going to be millions of still of unemployed Canadians and some failed small businesses are almost inevitable. Government's going to have to stimulate that, and there are some signs that the Canadian government intends to do that. They've brought back Mark Carney from Britain, who favors these things. You, are you in favor of a green, green New Deal, Bob? Yes. Yes, I'm quite comfortable with that. <laughs> um, I mean, it's an American expression. And can you, can you tell us a bit about um, what, what that looks like in your, in your yeah, view? Yeah, um, I think Biden's kind of bought into it in, in the U.S. Um, under persuasion from Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and others on the kind of left of the Democratic Party. I mean, I think what it's about is creating a whole series of jobs. I mean, even if it's not economic to produce solar panels in the U.S. or Canada, though I think it could be if it were relatively automated, you're still going to have to install them on the roofs you have and in the fields that you have in the country you're in and near to where the point of use is. So there's a lot of jobs in that and in renovating houses to be more energy efficient. And that's what I see a Green New Deal doing. And it, it, it also works well in the countryside because that's where, you know, you've got room to put in windmills. You're not going to put windmills in downtown Toronto. You're going to put them in a field somewhere and you can still have agriculture around them. Um, I, that's the way I imagine a Green New Deal taking place, and it would create jobs for quite a long, long time. Well, that's an interesting, and I think um, you know we we see the discussion around the Green New Deal uh, tied in to questions around just transition. So we have jobs, but, but we also have a discussion of of justice, um, and and you know you had mentioned environmental justice earlier, uh, and Robert Bullard's work. Um, and maybe that's an opportunity to, to come back to uh, a theme that I wanted to ask you about, which is pretty central to the study of environmental politics, particularly here in Canada. And that is uh, you know, colonialism and neocolonialism. Uh, so as you know, uh, this was a country born from the occupation and theft of indigenous land. And, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, heard from the truth and reconciliation commission that this was, you know, a, a form of cultural genocide. And we have seen sometimes in Canada's political history, um, synergies and shared interests between white settler environmentalists and 
indigenous rights movements at times, and perhaps, you know, some of the more notable uh, coalitions um, are, you know, movements to protect land from logging and development in in the in the seventies and eighties. Um, but of course, those alliances have been tested, and um, in some instances, environmentalism itself has been accused or the, the environmental movement has been accused of taking on a neo-colonial character. So I guess I'm wondering if you can comment on the evolving relationship between the environmental movement and the movement to advance Indigenous sovereignty and Indigenous rights in Canada. Um, is this a solid alliance in the Canadian political arena or uh, does that relationship have further room to grow? I think it has has room to grow and it 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 goes way back i mean i tried to remember as far back as i could it would be the late 60s mercury from pulp and paper plants and grassy narrows were were, were addressed mm -hmm. by both environmental activists and native communities all through northern ontario and elsewhere in canada i remember this just an incident um I was traveling with the Royal Commission. We went to Red Lake, Ontario, which is well north of uh, huh. Thunder Bay. And uh, driving along the road with the windows uh, open, you could smell this horrible smell as you went over a, a creek. And uh, we then went to hearings for the, the Royal Commission. And um, there were people from the company claiming that it's just all these people from Toronto who come up here and notice pollution. It's really not that polluted and everything is fine. I thought, oh my God, <laughs> this is a strange world we're, we're living in. But I mean, it, it, there was unity among native community of Red Lake and the, us environmental activists from the big city down there. Um, so I mean, there's other examples of mm. clear-cutting the area around Tomogamy, um, you know, and it was led by Gary Potts, the chief in the area, uh, opposition to the James Bay power dams was native-led, um, got built anyway. But I mean, it, it just, there's this been a unity between the two groups on most issues most of the time. And if you sort of look to the future, I mean, there is... There is a risk of disagreement. I know on some of the pipelines currently being put in, some native communities see it as a possible source of income, either because they get income because it's their land or because they get income from the jobs of installing the pipelines. So there could be a falling out there. But on the other side, there could be enormous unity around renewable energy, around water quality, around energy efficiency conversions of housing. Housing is a crucial issue in Native First Nations communities. And um, that's something that both sides would be in, in favor of, especially because the alternative is schlepping large amounts of fossil fuels up there to run, you know, to run a heating system. Um, I've seen studies and, and experiments with growing local food in the far north even in the Yukon, but for the most part, say in northern Ontario, northern Saskatchewan, and so forth, with experimental tech about throwing it down below the frost line, even into, say, you'd never grow it in February in northern Ontario, but you could grow it in late November, early December, <laughs> grow fresh, fresh vegetables, that kind of thing. And the, so there are groups that are experimenting with this, and I think it has a lot of potential. That's interesting. So, so it sounds like you know, well, the future is unwritten, but there are opportunities for uh, you know a, a robust relationship to continue uh, between sort of the the environmental movement and um, indigenous rights and reconciliation movement. So that maybe ties into uh, the next question I have for you, which is about how environmentalists um, advocate for change. Uh, so you have been an environmentalist advocating for change for many decades. And I'm curious to hear from you about, you know, what you've learned about how um, this process can, uh, can occur. What are some ways that environmental advocates can achieve meaningful change? What are some tips from the trade? 
Um, just just a few, a couple things I thought of. Um, environmental progress may, works best when it focuses on all levels of government. You know, not just going after the feds or the provinces, but going from local all the way to national and international. And because some of the time, some of them are going to be on side when others of them aren't going to be on side. And you, I mean, you've got to be politically sophisticated about where you put your energy um, at any given time. And if, if, if all levels of government had gone bad at the same time, which is unusual, um, thank goodness, um, <laughs> but you can take an all institutions approach, you know, go, as we, we talked about corporations before or small businesses, they, they can be influenced by their employees, they can be influenced by investors, they can be influenced by customers, um, you know, go into the local supermarket and say, oh, I can't shop here anymore, you don't have X. Um, that kind of approach. So you're looking at trying to influence other institutions or the institution you're in, the university, get a change in curriculum. I'm very keen on having environmental journalism as a major. If I can just pick up on that, Bob, clearly communicating the message of the environmental movement has been important for the movement to have an impact over these last uh, 50 years. And it's been a big part of your work. You were the founding editor of Alternatives Journal. I wonder if you can tell us a bit about how the environmental movement has tried to get its message across over the years and and what you perceive as the uh, the effectiveness or the strengths or limitations of that approach. Why don't I try a couple of recent things that I've seen happen that that worked. Um, the Fridays for the Future has, has had an enormous influence. I mean, I've followed it quite closely because my son and my six-year-old granddaughter and uh, her mom were all involved uh, in the early days with a half a dozen people in Toronto before anyone had heard of Greta Thunberg. Um, they leafleted various places and uh, eventually got to the point where they were they put paid ads on every TTC train for a month which I believe cost twelve thousand dollars which they raised on a GoFundMe page um, so and to the point where Fridays for the future turned out 40,000 people for demonstrations I don't think there's been a demonstration like that for a very long time. And then COVID came along and pretty much ended large crowd kind of events. But um, it, they will be back. And I think they made a difference. Um, and I, I think that's hmm. the important thing. Find new and creative ways to communicate, to raise attention to a particular issue. I mean, and, and uh, climate change became very much the visible issue, the dominant issue in, in, in the environmental movement um, for the last two, three, four years. And uh, I think it'll ultimately make a considerable um, difference. One other way to communicate that I've found useful personally is um, to make everyday life habit changes, but to do it very visibly and do it kind of proudly. And um, I have an electric car, um, as, as sort of practicing what I preach. And um, I had the, the charger put on the side of the house right near where everyone walks by and visibly plug it in. And... Um, <laughs> And I get a lot of people stopping and chatting, neighbors. Um, how does it work? What does it cost? Mm -hmm. da, da, da. And I say I have solar panels, and they produce enough not only for the house but the car for about eight months of the year. And um, they're all quite interested. And I know three or four people who found me and, and, and asked questions about the car and 
either bought that one or a more recent model of mm. something else. So, I mean, it, it can be done about all kinds of other things, not just sort of rich people's consumption, but with regard to things like travel. I mean, you all, everyone gets asked all the time, oh, where are you going this winter or where are you going this summer? Where are you going for your summer vacation? This is all before COVID, and I take that to be temporary. Um, I mean, I think the answer is, well, I don't travel as much. I find I can do really nice things not so far from home. And you can get into discussions that way. And I think that actually really works as a, as a means of sort of personal communication with people you know already, or your neighbors or uh, even your relatives. Anyway, I just throw that out as a, a different way to communicate. Those are great examples about the the impact that we have immediately in our social spheres and in our neighborhoods. Um, do you have any last thoughts to share with our listeners on the history of environmental politics in Canada since the 60s? What's your big picture uh, look back? Yeah, I had a two or three things I thought of about that. And one of the ones that that's really stuck with me from way back to sort of five years after I started teaching these kinds of things. One student told me that, you know, some people call your course gloom and doom 310. And I realized <laughs> that my, the emphasis was on informing people what the problem was, what pollution does, how people are affected by it, how it's bad for your health and, you know, but I'd, I'd switched the emphasis. I, you still have to alert people to what are the real issues and what are not so serious issues. But the focus became on solutions rather than problems. How do you fix it? I mean, how do you change minds and how do you do it? What, do you, what needs to be done um, and how can it be done and what are the economic and effects of, of doing that? And um, I think also... People are mindful, young people, especially in, in, in universities, they're trying to make career choices. What are they going to do with their lives? Um, and I think that's a way of communicating, get them to get a sense of, well, what's coming down the road? I mean, I would guess action on climate change for the next 10, 20 or 30 years is there. I mean, it's building renov anything from building renovation to change the diets to a wide array of things that will have to change. And, you know, you think about what you're going to do for a living, you think about it in those terms. Um, because I think most young people want to do something positive environmentally with their lives. And I think there's lots of ways to do that. And it can be in almost any industry. It could be in banking making decisions about who, what business you're going to loan money to. Um, it could be in any, any field. Anyway, oh, the, other, the other thing is sort of a, a thought as a, a slight warning that I, I didn't discuss it much, but I've written about it, about waves of environmentalism. The 60s and 70s was one positive wave. The bridge between the 80s and 90s was another positive, enthusiastic wave. But then there's a lull. And there's going. I think there'll always be ups and downs. So you've got to um, think about you know those and be prepared for them. And don't think we've all lost it, and the world's going to come to an end if we're in a five-year lull in environmental action. Hmm. Well, one of the things I appreciate about this interview, Bob, is that you bring uh, a long time horizon to your your memories and your. Uh, your perspective on this movement and for example it's talking about these waves of environmentalism over time and how you know there can be a lot of action on the part of individuals being concerned and newspapers talking about it and governments responding and industries responding and then you might have periods where it feels like there's a bit of regression or retrenchment or not much progress and then it comes again and i think that kind of uh perspective is so useful for the, the listeners to this show uh, who don't have that long time horizon to really uh, see how much has changed over the last 50 years. Um, I also really appreciate, uh, I was going to ask you a question about what brings you hope, but it, but the last uh, responses you were giving were really talking about, you know, how you 
in your own teaching, you switch from talking about the problem to say, let's really focus on the solutions and uh, talking about the career opportunities uh, that are ahead for, uh, you know, in a more sustainable and just world, uh, there's going to be jobs and uh, there are jobs today and there'll be more jobs in the future. And so I really appreciate uh, that optimism. What brings you so much hope, Bob? I, I suppose I, I'm, I'm prone to, to being doubtful about the future at times. And you just say, why go on that way? Because you can see the, the 50 years that it, it does get better. I mean, I, I look at what's going on in the United States these days where I was born, and it's terrifying. It, it's, but I don't think it's necessarily permanent. Um, because there have been cycles. I mean, Ronald Reagan famously said, seen one redwood, seen them all. So he was in favor of leaving one redwood up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that kind of anti-environmental attitude was there, but it, it, and it rolled a lot of things back, just as we've done a few times here in Canada in the 90s. It didn't look all that good uh, environmentally, um, but it, it has turned around uh, a couple of times since. So I think that's where the optimism comes from. You just, you know, maybe you take a rest for a while and rethink how you communicate. And uh, and I'm, I'm just enormously encouraged by uh, how many young people have come out on, on climate marches um, all of last year. Um, it was led by high school students. Well, I, I, like I say, I think uh, you've given us a lot of perspective today, and, uh, and I appreciate the optimistic uh, tone that you're leaving. And as you say, while you might sometimes be pessimistic, if you look back at this history, the data shows us that there's a, a lot of reasons for hope. Um, so we should probably wrap it up there. And I want to thank you, Bob, so much for your time and sharing your thoughts and wisdom with us today. Uh, that's it for this episode of the Ecopolitics Podcast. Don't forget to check out our other episodes in the series at ecopoliticspodcast.ca or give us a shout on Twitter or at our handle, ecopoliticsp. Uh, and thank you once again to Bob for joining us today and to our audience for tuning in and to Ryan as my co-host. And we will uh, look forward to presenting another episode to you soon.